So his talk is entitled Developing Personalized Medicine in the NHS 100,000 Genome Project. Please join me in welcoming Sir Malcolm Grant. Well, thank you so much, Paul, for that eloquent and thoughtful uh, introduction. Uh, but can I just say uh, how much I've enjoyed yesterday and today? I think this has been a stunning uh, symposium and really at the cutting edge around the world of what so many of us are trying to do uh, in relation to developing personalized medicine. And we in England, I should first of all explain that my remit in the NHS extends just to England. Um, Scotland and Wales have their own uh, national health services, uh, but that leaves us still with 55 million patients. Uh, and um, the huge responsibility of an organization that is valued by the British public more highly than the BBC, the Royal Family, the Church of England, the Pope, and, and even politicians. So <laughs> when one talks about transforming a much-cherished organization, one has to anticipate that there will be uh, some pushback because the traditional response of the people who work in the NHS and beyond it uh, to uh, the type of uh, fiscal freeze that we have at the moment is that... Um, we just need more money to carry on as we are. Uh, and that's the wrong answer. Uh, the right answer is, what is it that science and technology can do to allow us to completely transform the quality, the safety, and the convenience of care for our patient population? And more, as I will try to explain today, uh, what more can we do to ensure that a healthcare system isn't just a patch and repair system, but is one that focuses on health? Uh, and not just solely on care. So I'd like to start off by giving a little bit of background to uh, why it is that we have embarked upon the 100,000 genome program, uh, 50,000 million uh, registered, 55 million registered patients, but also the critical thing, which is also, I think, a commonality with British Columbia of a single payer, but also pretty much a single provider, uh, we consume 9.3% of GDP on health care in England, of which 8% is tax-borne. It's one of the highest proportions of tax-borne contribution to health care uh, in the developed world. And from that uh, is the mantra of the NHS, which is to provide care for every person free of charge at the point of need. It's a comprehensive system. Our patients do not pay, by and large, for pharmacy. Uh, for pharmacy, there is a prescription charge of eight pounds and five pence each time a prescription is taken out, and over 90% of our prescriptions are exempted from it. Uh, so it's a, a genuinely free uh, and affordable healthcare system, at least to the user. However, like every other healthcare system in the world, the current level of demand exceeds the availability funding. Just to put that in particularly the UK context, since 1948 and the foundation of the NHS, the Capital, uh, the, the, the compound annualized growth rate has been around 4 to 5% real per annum. Uh, for the past five years, we've survived on about 1.1% real uh, per annum. And for the next five years, it looks likely that we shall have no more than 1.5% real. By the way, this is at a time when there are acute cuts across the whole of public services. Healthcare in Britain, as elsewhere, is crowding out other public services. And uh, there is a limit to the extent to which the public will tolerate that, while still, of course, anticipating that it gets fine care. So we have taken the view that this requires a transformation of the current models of care. There is a white paper that we published last year called the um, NHS Five-Year Forward View, the first time, by the way, that the NHS, NHS has produced its own vision for the future rather than being invited to implement a political vision uh, created by a ministerial department. That is the point of having an independent board, NHS England, uh, which I am chairing. Um, the other things that help to drive the success we think of the 100 Genome Program are having world-class universities with schools of clinical and life sciences. Um, four of our universities are in the top 10 universities in the world. Um, there's UCL and... Um, well, I forget the other three, but um, <laughs> uh, 
there is a remarkably profound uh, strength in life sciences and medicine uh, right across the university sector. Uh, we also have very strong industries in life sciences and in data. Uh, and one of the objects of the 100,000 Genome Project is to stimulate industry and commercial development of the products across the whole of the UK and to um, try to uh, develop a home uh, industry. Uh, and then we have strong political commitment, stable over time. I wouldn't have written those three words uh, a month ago, but exactly a month ago we had a general election uh, which returned David Cameron in prime, as prime minister, and his personal uh, support for this program has been uh, tremendously important. And funding. Well, you know, when, when a senior politician announces a major initiative and announces a sum of money uh, to go with it, and you look at your own budget and you wonder where the sum of money is coming from, um, there is a moment of confusion. Uh, and um, uh, we, 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 we fought for some time to understand where 100 million and 200 million and 300 million would come from. But of course, it comes from the NHS. Uh, and it's a relatively small proportion of the over 100 billion uh, pounds that we spend every year. And if it is indeed a major investment for transforming uh, the NHS, then it is a profoundly good investment. And then clinical engagement. I have to say, at the outset of this, this 100K Genomes Project was driven very strongly uh, within government by a Canadian, a man from Saskatchewan called John Bell, who's now the Regis Professor of, of Medicine at Oxford, and also by Dame, Dame Sally Davis, whom I know a number of people in this room know. And um, I have to confess to being one of the deep skeptics at the beginning. I've, I've moved my position a little, um, but I think today what I'm going to try and get across to you is some of the sheer complexity of what we're doing. It, I'm not a clinician, so my study today is much more about the logistics of trying to carry through a hugely complex program, even with these remarkable drivers for success. So let me just take you through very quickly the uh, chronology. Uh, in December 2012 uh, is the announcement by the Prime Minister. Um, we are committed to completing the sequencing of the first 100,000 genomes by the end of 2017. Uh, in 2012-13, we set up a variety of work streams. Uh, Sally Davis set up work streams that were going to look at the scientific considerations, particularly, as I'll explain in a moment, how disease conditions would be selected for priority uh, for participation in the program about data storage, ethics, and consent. I chaired a separate strategy group at the same time to try to understand, uh, with the engagement of clinicians and academics, how we could get this uh, to function as a program uh, across the whole of the NHS. Then, between us, we established a company. Genomics England uh, is an unusual company in that it's wholly owned by the government. There are no shares owned elsewhere, uh, but it does help us enormously with procurement uh, and in uh, undertaking procurement, particularly of sequencing, uh, without having to go through the normal government uh, procurement uh, processes, and that's been immensely valuable. So the vision thing. Uh, I'm not going to go into this in great detail because so many of the speakers over the last two days have trod along this path. Uh, but just to demonstrate that this is a philosophy that is uh, shared by us. The combination of genomics, transcriptomics, proteomics, and metabolomics uh, creates for us an opportunity that many have called a tipping point. Uh, by the way, I, I see so many tipping points uh, in the NHS, not all of them favorable. And um, <laughs> as somebody said to me recently, you know, there have been so many strategies uh, for the NHS, and so we had more visions than Joan of Arc. And we've had more pilots than British Airways. Um, so visions and pilots and, 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 and projects, but this one could just be different. So what are the benefits that we're seeking from it? We seek, first of all, the enhanced discovery of pathogenic variants. We want new treatments, devices, and diagnostics to accelerate the uptake uh, with advanced genomic medicine practice integrated into the NHS, and that is, that is the, the holy grail to increase public understanding and support, uh, which I suspect will be driven not by us in particular, but much more by democratization of medicine and by the use of personal uh, devices such as smartphones and access to patients' own medical information. And then a very important component, which is to stimulate and advance UK life sciences industry. 
So um, the design features, how do we set about creating this new model? First of all, the insistence that it be structurally integrated with the NHS, and that's where NHS England comes in. We are a partner uh, with the Department of Health through the company Genomics England. I sit on the board, but of course, when I'm on the board of Genomics England, my fiduciary duty is to the company, not to the NHS, but these lines occasionally get a little blurred. Uh, the critical thing is to symbolize the support of the NHS at the highest level for what the company is trying to do. Uh, second design principle, we would select the patient cohort. This, this is the really incredibly strong point of starting from scratch. Uh, it, this is not an ad hoc uh, proposal. This is where the patient cohort is selected on good scientific grounds. Uh, informed consent, I'll come back to. State-of-the-art sequencing, we wanted to ensure that that would take place in England uh, and not in China. Um, we wanted to ensure also that the data would be held in a secure and monitored environment. Uh, we would engage scientists and clinicians. We would prescribe routes of access to uh, commercial companies, and I'll describe uh, in my comments how that will be done. Uh, and also I will talk about the intellectual property uh, and the genomic medicine education program. So there, those are the design principles, if you like, of what we're trying to achieve. So making it happen. The early stages, we set out to identify the medical conditions for priority for sequencing. And um, after a considerable amount of consultation across the whole of the clinical environment, we set upon cancers, on rare diseases, and on infectious diseases. Uh, on cancers, because they showed great promise, and particularly in certain cancers, and I've listed them here, uh, for, uh, for, for genetic and genomic analysis and ultimately for, uh, for treatment. Uh, rare diseases because although we have over 7,000 of them, they do affect a significant proportion of the total population, something like uh, 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 6%. And we understand that what more that we can learn about rare diseases and genetic outliers, uh, the more we can understand about disease itself. So that was uh, a major scientific principle. And then also uh, pathogens, some of the infectious diseases. I have to say that the, the major balances between cancers and rare diseases, um, the infectious diseases, is a relatively small part of the total program. Um, having done that and having then run an Oxford study, a, a pilot study at Oxford uh, led by Peter Donnelly, uh, we were in a position to start engaging clinicians and institutions in the project. And the way we did this was to um, use a, a competitive process uh, we wanted to try and get some regional coverage of centers which would be genomic medicine centers. They would be uh, centers that would be run by individual hospitals, hospital trusts as we call the institutions that run the hospitals, or academic health science centers which actually normally have a number of hospitals under their umbrella. And um, we didn't uh, want to fall into the trap which is so commonly the case, which is to say uh, to the NHS, we're going to impose these upon you. You can have one up there in Newcastle and you can have one in Manchester. Uh, what we did is run a competitive process because we believed that with a competitive process, not only would the clinicians get excited, but so would the chief executives of the hospitals because this would become a differentiator. You're, either we're a hospital with a GMC or you were not. And, and I have to say this is quite an important message across the whole of the NHS because I anticipate that over the coming decade we will see more and more instances of concentrating specialized services in a smaller number of, 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 of service centers. And so I think a number of people anticipated that this might be the first and it would be wise to put in a very strong bid. Uh, so we have now designated 11, and I'll show you in a moment the geographical distribution. Uh, Go Live uh, occurred in March with um, rare diseases. Uh, and has just really starting to occur with cancers. Uh, the responsibility of the centers is to acquire and process 90,000 samples. We, by the way, 90,000 is 10,000 short, 10, short of 100,000. We're leaving ourselves some headroom. And we have left on the website the opportunity for people to nominate other uh, conditions uh, for sequencing so that we can learn as we go. And much will depend upon what we learn over the next couple of years. Uh, we are requiring the centers also to uh, capture the clinical phenotypic data, uh, validate the findings from the whole genome sequencing and provide feedback. I'll demonstrate in a moment the chart through which the process proceeds and then to measure and monitor the impact. 
So here is a map which just uh, quite succinctly demonstrates the um, 11 GMCs. Uh, we've got regional uh, coverage, but we've also announced that we may yet go for a second wave, and we may go for another two or three. But the critical thing is that actually regional coverage is useful, but it's not a condition uh, of running a program like this. Uh, and the critical thing is to have a center that's up and ready and has the clinical and academic capacity uh, to do what we wish to see. So briefly, the operating model is that um, we, NHS England, are the prime contractor and the funder. Uh, we've allocated an internal budget of 20 million just to help the centers get up and running. The centers themselves will be uh, investing in expanding their own capacity. But our role is um, both overseeing and supportive. Um, we are also um, requiring them to act as lead organizations with specific leads with a number of uh, tentacles out into their own geography and with some LDP, some local delivery partners working with them. So it's conceivable, for example, that a major tertiary centre uh, will have a number of secondary and DGH, sorry, district general hospital centres feeding in to the whole of the exercise. It won't all be done uh, in a single central point. We're also trying to engage all 11 to work together as a network, uh, sharing best practice and sharing information as to what they're doing. So we have an implementation unit overseeing all of that. Forgive the detail of this, but these design principles, the more I've worked on this, the more critical they've seemed at each stage as we've gone through this. We're trying to do something very big across a very big population, uh, and we're trying to do it in a way which, and I should emphasize, this is not a research project. Uh, and, and that's a really critical thing to get in. It's not a research project. It's an NHS transformation program. And we need to get uh, clinical engagement as well as academic uh, excitement. Uh, this slide uh, merely demonstrates how the, each of the GMCs coordinates a, a network of delivery organizations. Uh, we've put everything on a contractual basis. Uh, there are key performance indicators, reporting metrics, a financial schedule, uh, and the... Uh, each GMC is then paid for the successful samples, uh, which have been assessed following the sequencing. And um, uh, there is a, a quality uh, approval scheme and detailed specification and um, detailed outcome specifications for sample processing and, and DNA extraction. Trying to ensure that the samples that eventually come through to sequencing are of a consistently high quality and have sufficient uh, viable DNA in them to uh, enable uh, high quality sequencing to occur. Uh, as you might expect, we have spent a long time on developing consent, uh, extensive engagement with patient groups uh, to try to uh, ensure that we have a consent that is, on the one hand, sufficiently clear and sharp for patients to understand what it is to which they're agreeing, and yet, on the other hand, sufficiently flexible to allow us five years or ten years to have an ability to use the data that we have, uh, and also to understand what are our responsibilities in relation to reporting back to patients, particularly where those patients are children. What happens over the next ten years if a sample taken from a child um, uh, then has that child growing into adulthood as our duty to the child or to the adult. Uh, we've had a research ethics committee spend a long, long time on this. I still find this one of the most difficult areas, actually, uh, because if we don't get this right, we do, I think, um, uh, undermine uh, the acceptability of the whole program in the eyes of the public. So it's not one of those areas where at the moment there is huge ethical concern as there is around the use of patient data more generally in England, and I can come back and talk about that later, perhaps in the uh, panel session. But in this area, by and large, patients and families are queuing up to be part of this program. Nobody has a belief that this will necessarily directly affect their own care. Uh, but particularly for those families uh, where there is a rare genetic disorder, uh, there's huge enthusiasm to understand how the experiences of their family can be used to assist families uh, across the country in the future. So informed consent is critical to this. And we, we have a consent form which is about eight or nine pages long, which I, I think is probably about seven or eight pages too long. 
Uh, we're trying to work out ways of doing this. How, how do we have a really lively video involving patients themselves explaining uh, what this is about and why it's important without being proselytizing? <laughs> the balance to all of this is, uh, is immensely important. So um, I don't need to go into all of this. It's about how we assure the material and the information. But just to stress that this isn't a haphazard ad hoc process. We have buttoned everything down. Uh, we have formal agreements. Uh, we have accountabilities. And we have data sharing uh, between the various agencies who are involved in the, in the program. So the next stages in, in making it happen was the procurement of sequencing technology. Just a few words around this. When we embarked upon this, the cost of sequencing was much higher than it is today. Remember, we're going back to 2012, 2013. Our expectation at that time uh, was it might be as much as £10,000 per sequence. We could see that it would come down, but we couldn't readily model uh, the curve. Uh, but we also knew that by signing a contract for 90,000 sequences, uh, there was a very significant impact of that on, on, on price. Uh, and as you can imagine, we went through a full and open procurement process, and um, as a consequence of that, uh, appointed Illumina to do the, the work with us. There were many attractions of Illumina at the time. Their technology was, was, was certainly leading. Uh, it was also an advantage that um, their capacity to uh, sequence at speed and at scale had been enhanced by taking over a company, Selexia, which had come out of the um, chemistry department in Cambridge. Uh, and then uh, as a consequence of the next steps of this, uh, Illumina already had a presence in Cambridge and they're now moving into new premises on the Sanger Center site, which is another way of bringing in one of the other great actors in the UK for life sciences funding, which is the Wellcome Trust. Uh, so we have their support and we have that of the Medical Research Council in a slide that I'll demonstrate in a moment. This actually has not been all plain sailing. I, I would say that we are still uh, working uh, with some difficulty to secure absolutely viable samples uh, for sequencing. Uh, we had assumed uh, that FFPE uh, was going to be problematic because of the quantity of DNA that gets destroyed uh, in the formal and fixing process. What we had assumed, however, was that fresh frozen would be a viable answer. But early stages have demonstrated there's still quite a lot of work to do on that. We're, we're getting there. And what we've done in our relationship with Illumina is actually just to develop a partnership uh, to try and work together to get to the point where we have viable samples that we can use. Uh, we think we're, 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 we're pretty much there now. But the other critical thing that we have planned for is that the samples simply wouldn't be taken in sequence, but we would also maintain a, a, a biobank of samples which would enable us uh, in future waves of technological development uh, to use uh, them for proteomic, metabolomic, uh, and other omic analysis, uh, allowing us to move more rapidly towards a comprehensive molecular level uh, system of information. So a very important um, early step safeguard. Um, the role of the NHS through this, we've tried in this slide to demonstrate where the, where the GMC role starts. So it starts at the top with the consent and sample collection, the DNA extraction, it goes into the biorepository, it goes through sequencing. There's then a very complex process of variant calling, interpretation, feedback to the clinician, validation and treatment. In most cases, we won't ever get right around the whole circle. Uh, but we know that we will get certainly right through, uh, we hope, to interpretation and, and, and potentially feedback to, um, uh, to clinicians. I'm going to go through some of those steps in a little more detail uh, in a moment. So um, the critical thing around interpretation, I think, is summed up in the following slides. The first column here, headed the traditional way, I think is familiar to many people in this room. Uh, we, we start with an academic project, uh, we form a hypothesis, we go out and find funds, uh, and we form some collaborations, and we collect and analyze the data, and we validate the results, and then we publish, and um, uh, that's fine, thank you very much. Uh, and then we attempt to translate it into healthcare, uh, and at that point we fail um, uh, for at least um, 17 years. Uh, which is the average period from really smart idea to actually doing something for patients. Uh, so um, 
we go through an enormously complicated process of NHS and NICE evaluation and guidelines and education implementation program, and in the end, we have an absolutely perfect offering. So we thought, let's try and see how we speed that up. So we decided that we would create a set of clinical interpretation partnerships, um, G GSIPs, as we're calling them. Uh, and the hypothesis is that um, whole genome sequencing will enhance diagnosis. Uh, it needs a coalition of academics, NHS, and trainees working together uh, on whole genome sequencing within the GSIP domain. So we put out uh, a request for expressions of interest. I can tell you we now have 2,000 academics and clinicians have stepped forward to engage themselves in this program. I mean, it's quite remarkable. I'll show you in a moment what are the key domains on which they're working. Uh, but we can understand that this allows us to, to do a lot of things. Uh, it allows us to develop our approach to variant calling, our approach to interpretation and approach to validation across a significant population uh, in a way which uh, I don't think has been feasible in the past. Uh, so our anticipation is that we might be able to reduce um, uh, 17 years to three years by this concentration of person power uh, and feedback into the clinic. It's the feedback into the clinic uh, and also perhaps by 2017 embarking upon a further round. I'll come back to that in a moment. So as we thought through what these GSIPs would do, by the way, the GSIP program is chaired by Dame Kay Davis, a very distinguished geneticist at, at University of Oxford, and she has led this whole program. Uh, we want to accelerate academic and industry partnership in the development of diagnostics and therapies with researchers and with the NHS, and we want to equip trainees. This education part of the package is absolutely critical. Uh, students going through medical school today would be surprised to hear the presentations uh, that we've heard over the past two days. Uh, the pace of change will outstrip uh, many of the learnings that our recent medical graduates have had. We've established within this a portal for international collaboration. Uh, we are receiving almost daily expressions of interest from around the world of collaborating with the 100,000 Genome Program. All the data that's generated goes to the Genomics England database, and all the data are available to all. I'll demonstrate in a moment how we draw a red line around patient security and identifiable data. Uh, and um, we will be also using this exercise to promote R&D in the UK. So here are the key domains. I've given some examples under rare diseases just to give a sense of how different uh, clinical interpretation groups are lining up behind different conditions. Uh, there are 15 in rare diseases. I've not listed them all. Uh, eight in relation to cancer. But the interesting one to me was the functional domains. Uh, we've got people lining up to work on uh, EMRs, uh, on validation and feedback, on ethics and social science, functional effects, health economics, machine learning, population genomics, translational research, functional cross-cutting issues. So um, we're starting to see, I don't know, just a, I think people are actually getting excited. <laughs> about this. <coughs> just, just on that note, that's a large number of people, 2,000 people. You know, I suspect across the 1.3 million people that the NHS employs in England, that 2,000 is probably the limit of understanding of where this program is and, and where it's going. I mean, we have not yet successfully broadcast uh, what this might yet mean uh, for, for, for changes in clinical care. Um, IPR is critical to this, and, and again, as a design principle, we want to do what everybody wants to do, which is to allow information to be shared as widely as possible, and yet to protect that which has commercial value for two reasons. One, if you lose the commercial value, then it doesn't get exploited. And two, if there is to be a return on the investment by the government, we want it to feed back into NHS care, and we want to be able to capitalize uh, on that. Uh, so just, just very simply, uh, we decided as a design principle that GEL, Genomics England, would own the samples and the data relating to them. Uh, we have um, uh, an arrangement with the, with the genomic medicine centers, the 11, that they would own the clinical data relating to their patient, which has to be right, uh, but they would grant GEL a wide license for use of the data. Likewise, in relation to the IPR that's developed, any IPR that's developed in relation to the preparation of the samples, you could see you know, a particular hospital developing a particular technique which has some commercial value. Um, but 
Jell owns all the sequence data, sequence data, all the analysis, the GMC results, and the reports, but it grants a license to each genomic medicine center to use them for clinical purposes, uh, but not research rights. Uh, Jell owns the GSIP outputs and their IPR, and um, GSIP members need to disclose or get consent to dealings. This, this is quite important. We had a long discussion about this at a board meeting just last week as to how you set the limits to allow academics to do what they would normally do, which is to engage in a, in a project uh, and publish, whilst at the same time protecting uh, confidentiality and, and IPR. So hence the necessity to have a consenting uh, and fair dealing right. Uh, the gene consortium is our mechanism of allowing commercial access to anonymized data. Uh, as I'll demonstrate in a moment, uh, the data is held in, in a data set and there's a knowledge bank alongside it. And what we wanted to do was to use um, commercial partners to do two things. I think one, one thing was to actually to help us with this whole process of interpretation, uh, variant calling uh, and validation, um, and to get the best in the world to come in state of the art uh, and to help us to develop this. And there will be commercial value to them simply from doing that and having the opportunity to interact on this front. Uh, but secondly, uh, to offer an opportunity to both big companies and small companies. So the big companies, uh, and um, there are confidential um, uh, size limits I won't go into, the big companies can enter into a relatively small consortium. There will be about 10 of them engaging as mainstream gene partners uh, working closely with us uh, and also with sharing between them. And, and smaller companies, because we didn't want to exclude SMEs. Uh, so that we have lifted uh, a capitation, capitation uh, qualification uh, to allow others to come in as well. And then we have a patent strategy. I won't go into details of that. I'm, I'm not sure that patents are going to form a large part of what we do, but it's important to safeguard uh, the area for them. So here's the big picture. Um, and this, this slide, I hope, starts to demonstrate how all of those component pieces uh, fit together. We start, obviously, with patients and families at the top, and the relationship with them is directly with their clinicians, who are through the NHS Genomic Medicine Centers, uh, but also the local delivery partners who then transfer the data and the samples to the Genomic Medicine Center. Uh, the DNA then goes into a, a repository. That's the DNA and the multiomics into a repository, and then goes to the sequencing center, which is based at the Wellcome Trust, but is an, an Illumina facility. Uh, and then as we move to the right-hand side, uh, there is in the center of all of this uh, refreshable, identifiable clinical data and a life course register, which is linked to anonymous data in the whole genome sequence. On the right-hand side, we are drawing in a great wealth of information that we hold already in, in primary care. Primary care in England is 100% digitized. Uh, I think this is not often understood. Uh, patients now have the right to access their own medical records uh, and have the right to make appointments and pharmacy engagements and repeat prescriptions online. Um, but actually, that's 55 million uh, filing cabinets uh, digitized as opposed to a single data set. But it's, it's a remarkable uh, achievement. Hospital episodes are in a different set of filing cabinets, uh, some of them literally in, in, in paper, but no, I won't go into that. Um, what we're able to do is to draw these data across, including the cancer registries, the rare disease registries, infectious disease, mortality data, patient entry, and start to create a huge knowledge bank uh, against which we can then uh, assess uh, the, the, the sequence data that we're getting from uh, the whole genome sequencing. Uh, and then underneath that layer, you will see uh, the research data infrastructure, the, the GSIP model, um, Pump primed by the Medical Research Council, uh, sequential builds of pseudonymized data and whole genome sequencing, and there's a safe haven in here uh, that people can work within. So the GSIP team are within the safe haven, and they're working also on annotation and quality control. Below the red firewall uh, is the access uh, that we grant to others. Um, so the patient data, the uh, identifiable patient data, stays in the safe haven, but outside it, uh, clinicians and academics are uh, training uh, for, for, for new specialists in this area and for uh, students and others, and industry has a capacity to access and use the, uh, the anonymized data uh, and, and to work with it. So it's a model which we think is actually quite secure, 
um, and it has a, a flow to it um, that should do the business. Okay, um, I won't dwell too much on the other slides because but I think these do help to understand the conceptualization that we have of the whole program. Um, much of this slide, I think, captures much of what we've heard from other speakers over the last two days. We, we can see that uh, clinical information can go right in the middle, diagnosis, insights, collaboration, infrastructure, equity of care, and best practice. Equity of care is quite difficult to deliver across a whole country uh, where the attractiveness of becoming a clinician in some parts of the country is less than the attractiveness in other parts of the country. And um, this is one of the reasons why we were anxious to ensure that we did have some regional coverage uh, of the genomic medicine centers. Um, so lesson number one, which is capturing, analyzing, and sharing phenotypic data is really hard. Uh, again, I was quite relieved actually to hear so many other speakers make a similar point and to realize that we were not alone uh, in this. Um, to, to some extent, it's, it's on account of the subjectivity uh, of the way in which phenotypic data is, is often captured. I think Martin was making a point in the session this morning that it's also an absence of patient input uh, into providing the phenotypic data uh, and patient reported outcomes, which um, we are promoting under, under a different head. Um, so um, this is having, I think, an impact on us uh, which might go in, in two directions. Um, first of all, I think just to ensure that we use this opportunity to become rather more professional in defining the ontology of disease uh, and getting greater standardization uh, across the 11 genomic medicine centers, because without that, uh, the, the data that's coming in, uh, they're not comparable. Uh, and um, I suppose the optimist in me thinks that if we could start to standardize their data and indeed start to standardize more of their practice, that could be a virus that could spread across the NHS more generally because uh, the, our data is um, uh, enormous, um, but our wisdom is limited. Uh, and we can only develop wisdom from data if we're better at standardizing it and if we're more professional about, about sharing it across the system. Uh, we also uh, are considering how we incorporate data that comes from patients and from wearable technologies uh, alongside the clinically recorded data. So um, this gives us, I, I, I hope, an understanding of how we perceive the processes of data collection, the combination of data, uh, and the analysis, uh, and how we also, and I point to that bottom left-hand corner because I think it's an area which to me still contains enormous promise, albeit it may be a bit further out at the moment, uh, which is how with these great uh, mounds of data, I was very interested when Paul Terry said, you know, uh, big data is just a lot of data. It doesn't mean anything other than that. Um, but what we have now, I think, is a growing industry which allows us to far better allow computers to learn uh, to take data which is relatively unstructured uh, and to bring it into uh, a more intelligible form. And one of the consequences of that, I think, is, well, am I wrong to worry too much about standardization of, the, of, of phenotype? Uh, shouldn't we be following back from the genotype to ask the questions about the phenotype uh, and go almost reverse the order? So that, I think, is a, is a big learning point for us. So um, <laughs> I said, my office prepared this slide and talked about the four Ps of precision medicine. They could have got it directly from Leroy Hood um, uh, yesterday. But again, the great relief that um, uh, we're heading in the same direction. I, I won't go into this because I, I think everybody is familiar with it. Uh, and I think everybody is familiar with this. Um, what it will mean, what it could mean for the NHS, and I still, I still retain the skepticism that you would expect of a chairman uh, of an organization such as the NHS. Um, I think we've got to be very cautious. I think we're a long way yet uh, from delivering on that big vision that we started with. We've only just started sequencing under this program. Uh, but I think some of these um, things that we hold out for it are perfectly legitimate. Uh, we know that we can develop molecular pathology. We're also already developing significantly across the NHS uh, the use of richer phenotypic data and a stronger link between clinical practice and applied genomics. Um, we want it to be more than just technology, and we're trying to understand how we develop 
uh, a clinical capacity across the broader NHS, how we develop better algorithms uh, for variant calling. Uh, we need it to be more robust. We need it to be scalable. We need it to be implementable. And above all, to get our clinical leaders involved. So what about after 2017? I would start by saying so much has changed since I first got involved in this in 2012 that even calling 2016 uh, is quite an issue and calling 2017 is, is even more interesting. The world has been changing at a pace ever since we got engaged on this. If we were to do 100,000 genomes again in 2017, the cost would be a fraction of that, which has cost us not only to do the sequencing, but also to do uh, the, the variant calling and the interpretation. Um, I think we can see uh, the use of the entire population as the research cohort. As we come towards uh, the end of next year, we'll be starting to ask questions. Should we sequence every newborn child? Uh, with parental consent, obviously. What would be the point of that? Uh, should we be sequencing more generally? Or should we be going for a wider array of diseases which may be, at the moment, thought to be rather too remote uh, to be informed by whole genome sequencing, but actually will become, I think, more sharply defined over the coming year? Uh, how would we move it into being a routine component of healthcare? Uh, everybody, everybody sequenced as a norm. If it's $100 a time, if we don't do it, somebody else is going to do it. Uh, and um, it, uh, it, 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 part of me is, is concerned that actually, if as a healthcare system you're not on top of this, somebody else will do it. And in five years' time, we'll pay much more than £300 million to buy it back uh, and to run it for ourselves. Um, the adverse drug reactions, I think, is a huge issue, uh, and that's been well emphasized by other speakers. Moving from fixed genomics to temporal multiomics, by that I mean, um, it was put to me very nicely last week by, by Rick Klausner at a conference I was at, which is that the, the genome is a horoscope. Uh, how do we convert it to a stethoscope? Uh, um, <laughs> well, think about it. So, uh, <laughs> How, how, how do you use uh, temporal, temporal um, use of the other omics uh, alongside the original genomic analysis uh, to inform what's happening? And I think that was very much along the lines in which Leroy Hood uh, was speaking yesterday. If that's the point, then we have a very different model of medicine from that which we have now. I would stress that all of this has to be international. Uh, we can do 100,000 genomes in the UK. We're up and running, and we'll do it. Uh, others will be following and following very quickly. Uh, but it's, it's a complete waste of time, and it secures no competitive advantage unless there is genuine sharing uh, of data across the world. That's the way in which science uh, properly develops. Um, the, um, I'll, I'll just go through the third last one, which worries me enormously. Uh, we've touched upon it earlier today. It's the proof of costs and savings for healthcare systems. Uh, we're doing other things to transform the NHS at the moment, uh, every one of which carries a high transitional cost. Uh, and dual running, as one moves from one clinical model to another, uh, carries high cost. We need to be able to persuade our political uh, uh, funders that here is something which is a long-term investment, which requires transformation funding up front, but which will yield uh, positive results in the end. The cynic in me says, Every time we come up with something that's better for patients, it costs us more. Um, if only because they live longer. Um, and, you know, sorry, I mustn't be too cynical as a, as a payer. Uh, uh, in a health service, we want a long-lived population in fine health. Um, and that will reduce the cost of health care. But that requires that we start to understand how we use some of this technology to deal with chronic long-term conditions and to relieve the burden of ill health on people with non-communicable disease. So that, I think, takes me to how we move this from a cottage industry, which every healthcare system in the world currently is. Uh, it's like weaving uh, in the 18th century uh, before the Industrial Revolution uh, with no proper concept of supply chain management, uh, no concept of scaling up across a whole industry. Uh, and maybe this is the tipping point that allows us to get there. And, of course, then, finally, to move from crisis management to the management of good health. Thank you.